which sounds like a relatively small thing. And it is, but the fact that you are ordering your life from the moment you wake up helps to set the structure of the rest of your day. And this happens at a psychological level, it happens at an emotional level. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Man Podcast, where we connect men in pursuit of their potential. I encourage you to join us as we embrace discomfort, cultivate community, and put wind in each other's sails. Now, if you're ready to take your personal and professional growth to the next level, do me a favor. Subscribe, like, and share the podcast so you can get a new episode each and every single week and help us keep bringing you this awesome content. And also, for the men out there, to connect with other men in pursuit of their potential, I encourage you to check out the Noble Knights group where you can find support, accountability, and mentorship to help you achieve your goals. Join us and become a community of like-minded men on a mission to elevate their capacity for life. And I'm excited to get some wind in our sails, guys, today. From my guest on the podcast, he's an assistant professor in the School of Social Work and College of Health and Human Services, an affiliated faculty member in the Department of Africana Studies at the UNC Charlotte. It is my pleasure to have Dr. Dante Bryant on the show today. Dr. Dante Bryant, thanks for being on, man. Hey, it's my pleasure, man. I appreciate, for, appreciate you for having me, truly. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. And I'm excited to hop into our, our conversation today. I'm excited to tap into your wisdom and your expertise. But before we do that, I want to make sure that the audience and you have an opportunity to get acquainted properly without my interruptions and me messing it up. So I'm going to step aside give you the microphone, give you the host, and give you the show so you can talk to the people directly, let them know who you are, what you do, and then we can uh, jump into the conversation, man. Uh, I mean, really, it's not much for me to say. I think you pretty much covered it, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm assistant professor here uh, at UNC Charlotte. Uh, you know, I'm a father, husband, son, brother, all of those things that come along. Uh, a decent friend, right? I try my best mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, but yeah, those are, those are really the highlights. So yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly happy moving forward as it's man. Yeah, no, I love it. And, uh, and speaking of being a decent friend, we were connected uh, through one of my coworkers and one of your <laughs> yeah. friends. Uh, shout out to Khalif Rhodes, and, um, <laughs> and and it came it came about from what gravitated me to Khalif and had us talking, and how your name came up was just two brothers who are out here getting it, who are going after it, identifying yeah. that we have ambition, trying to do some good things in the world, trying to take care of our families. And, yeah. and your name came up in terms of just, you know, other brothers who are doing the same. And I love finding that community and, and cultivating that. What I found and really the inspiration for this podcast was it is something that so many men are silently crying for is community, yeah. uh, mentorship, camaraderie, brotherhood. Um, and, and a lot of it is because of the, the silent battles that so many of us are fighting. So I, I wanted to tap into your expertise and, and really start the question very broad. And I know we can go in so many directions, but uh, when it comes to the societal and political systems and the social systems we find ourselves in today's world, um, what is the state of boys and, and men as we see it from your perspective, man? <laughs> uh, <laughs> great question. Uh, so I, I would say this. I think that... Um, in our, in, our, in our current society, and this goes for all societies, right? Um, there's a guy named Ian McGilchrist. He's a, a brilliant researcher. He talks about the human commodities and like what types of, what is the only true human commodity? And one of the things he points to is attention, hmm. which, you know, and you tend to hear things like, oh, well, you know, your time and um, your health. And it's like, yeah, but those really aren't necessarily human commodities insofar as you cannot control uh, and manage them, right? Like, you don't, you don't have the capacity to control time. Right? So you can't really waste it, right? Now, you can waste your life, clearly, but you can't necessarily waste time. Like, time is going to move as it moves. Um, and similarly with health, right? Like, you can kind of maximize your health, but you don't necessarily have a lot of control over it. But so he looks at human commodity as the greatest human commodity being attention, what we give our attention to. And then he goes on to make the argument that everything in our lives is vying for that attention. Mm -hmm. And a reason why that matters is that by default, what you give your attention to grows, right? 
And so I think the question about like society and, and the state of men and young boys, it, it really kind of revolves around what is it that young boys um, are giving their attention to, right? Mm. Because that's going to then impact what they become and what direction they move. Right. And so, like, also, too, now, I'll back up one step is uh, your boy, what's his name? Um, um, he makes the distinction, his name, what is our brother's name? Uh, Naeem Akbar, he's a black psychologist. Yeah. He makes the distinction between um, males, boys, and men. Right? And so you're born male. Yeah, it doesn't require any work, at least not on your part, right? You just, you mm-hmm. come into the world, uh, you are identified as male. The transition from male, from male to boy is uh, kind of self-propagating. It just happens by default, right? You grow taller, um, you, you learn to walk, you develop certain capacities and capabilities, you learn to speak, and you, by default, you kind of transition into boyhood. But the, then he makes a very clear distinction between boy and, and man. And the transition from boy to man is not an involuntary activity. It's a conscious <laughs> effort on, you know what I'm saying? It's a conscious effort on the part of the boy to take on certain types of responsibilities to move them in a very particular direction to embody a very specific way of being in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Which is then understood to be manhood, however that is defined. And so this idea that whatever we give our attention to grows, what we give our attention to then directs our path. So whatever I'm tending to in my environment, whatever I'm looking at is what I am aiming at. And so that becomes like the greatest human commodity in that sense. And so I think when you're asking the question about the state of boys and men within our current society, I think the the underlying question, the question that's beneath that one is, what is it that our boys are tending to? What are they giving their attention to? Because that's going to then determine what they become and how they function and move in the world. And I don't know that within our current social framework, and I I would say the last 30 years or so, we have been intentional about providing images, ideas, and ways of being in the world for young boys to tend to that will help them to evolve into healthy, productive, participating men in society. I don't yeah. know that we've been good about, we've been very good about doing that. Yeah. And, and, and for a variety of different reasons, but so, you know, I think we're, we're in a, a difficult spot. So, yeah, mm. those are, those are my first thoughts. I would say that. No, I love it because my thought process goes to, you know, when young girls, lagging behind in school the questions is okay what can we as a school do to help them catch up right and the contrary is boys now i mean they're eclipsed by uh to my last understanding and research women have a higher graduation rate out of college than than men do and the question is okay when are the men gonna step up what's going on to your point there i haven't heard much discussion on the reflection of what can we provide to these young boys to equip them in these schools? What can we provide to young boys to equip them to maybe manage their attention better? Because I would say a lot of the unintentional provisions have been distractions, not necessarily guidance. Yeah, no, it's interesting too, right? Because there's a couple of things there. One, (laughs) real questions about our our educational system, right? Like at baseline. Sure. Um, So there's that. But there's also, I think, within that, the um the idea of providing societies generally speaking have historically implemented rites of passages for boys into manhood and this is in in, in cultures throughout history have been very intentional about that Mm-hmm. Right about having a designated point in time in which you begin the process of transitioning from boyhood into manhood. And the reason why societies have, have focused so heavily on that is because nature doesn't necessarily provide it. Mm-hmm. Like for, for young girls, if 
you know, with the same model, if you're born a female, you naturally progress into a girl and eventually you become a woman. For that transition from girlhood to womanhood um, starts, nature initiates that process. Right? That's yeah. historically kind of been the argument, right? Because the moment that 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 young that young girl begin goes through her um, kind of like her, her biological transformation and she becomes able to bear children. Mm-hmm. Whether whether she likes it or not, she started the process of transitioning into womanhood. It's initiated for her, whether she likes it or not. And the reason why I say it starts the process is because the transition from a boy to a man, from a girl to a woman, in order to transition, you have to evolve. In order to evolve, you have to willingly take up responsibility and burden. That's what forces us to evolve, right? Like there's, you can't, it's, you know what I mean? Like you have to willingly yeah. take up those responsibilities abilities and the greater the burden or responsibility you're willing to carry the more your body has to respond and evolve in order to carry that particular capacity right like we know and we even see this in psychology like your central nervous system will activate and bring things parts of you into existence to deal with stressors and stimulation that are new and beyond your existing capacity if you willingly confront it like this is what exposure hmm. therapy is really all about. So if I if I take Ted and I'm like, hey, listen, I know that you're afraid of dogs. Yeah. Now, if I just bring <laughs> a dog man. into the room, <laughs> <don't> <laughs> yeah, <do> I, mean, <laughs> I just I say, okay, you, you have a fear of dogs. Okay, we're, we're going to address this fear. And I say, listen, would you mind if I brought a dog into the room? And you say, mm-hmm. no, no dogs in the room. And I bring a dog into the room anyway. And I force you to confront this fear or this anxiety. If I force you to do that, what ends up happening is it compounds your existing anxiety. So you actually get worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is one of the misnomers about exposure therapy. Exposure therapy is not me just confronting Ted with whatever it is that he's afraid of. Because if I do that, (laughs) you think it's got to be a will. Because if I just expose you to it, Ted's central nervous system actually codes for flight. That's what it codes for. And it yeah. strengthens that neural pathway. So next time Ted sees a dog, he'll run even quicker. <laughs> but if Ted says, you know what? I'm scared to death. Um, I can't deal with you letting the dog in the room. But if you stand outside the door with the dog and just open the door and let me see it, I'm willing to try that. As terrified mm-hmm. as you may be. And so that's what we do, right? We stay open the door. We stand there with the dog. Ted sees the dog. His anxiety goes up. He doesn't go anywhere. He sits there. He kind of digs himself in. It's like, okay, that's enough. And then we close the door. And you lasted five minutes. Yeah. What ends up happening, because you willingly confronted that, uh, that particular issue, that particular fear, your central nervous system actually codes for new protein, which means it actually brings parts of Ted into existence that was not previous here, previously here in order to deal with the likelihood that Ted will be sitting in front of a dog again. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Ted actually becomes more expansive. Like he literally grows in a very particular direction. It's the same thing that happens when you lift weights. Right? When you lift weights, you take your muscles to their breaking point and then you tear them. You break them down because you take them one step further than they were capable of going. Mm-hmm. And then what ends up happening is your body codes to bring new muscle fibers into being just in case you have to do that again. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And so now when we open the door the next day or the next week, Ted's able to go not from five minutes, but the 10 minutes. And it's not because yeah. Ted's less scared. Right. It's still (laughs) equally as terrifying as it was on day one. The difference is that there's more of Ted in existence now than there was a week ago. So it literally brings parts of you into existence. And that's what burdens willingly taking on burdens and responsibility does. Your body actually there's parts of you that will not come into existence unless your body is under stress that you willingly chose to engage in. Mm -hmm. And that stress is always associated with responsibility. I say all that to say, so for young girls, the moment they hit puberty, they cross over into puberty, they have the capacity to bear children. And there's not much of a greater burden or response, not burden, but greater responsibility that you have to take up than the yeah. likelihood of children. Now, how they choose to respond to that 
whether they willingly take up that responsibility or not depends on how quickly they evolve into womanhood. But you don't have anything like that for males. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing in there's nothing that's biologically drives them or initiates them into manhood in the same way. Because if a male, if a if a young boy gets a young girl pregnant, he's not he's not gonna bear the burden of that, the primary burden of responsibility of that. He's just not. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have the same impetus. And so societies, generally speaking, what they've done is they've put systems in place to intentionally initiate that process of transitioning from boyhood into manhood. And we don't have any of those in our current yeah. social system. What we end up having at boyhood is a lot of distractions, a lot of distractions, social media. You can look over here, look over here and all these different things to give our attention to. And as a result, time does not make you a man. Right? Time just makes you <laughs> older. And so, as, and so if as, as, as a boy, you are not giving your attention to challenges, responsibilities, and burdens that will move you, that will that are designed to move you into manhood. What will happen over time is you'll just have an adult child, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is what we see a lot of now, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. To your point, just going through the experience with my wife and, and the discussions we have in uh, the birth of our daughter and through the pregnancy process, and um, yeah. I was very intentional on wanting to go to, you know, just all the prenatal appointments and be as present as I can. And and just witnessing this burden or, or to your point, this responsibility that she has to step into. And, and there were discussions about, oh, I wish you could carry this baby a little bit for me. Right. Or I wish, you, you know, we could both birth this baby. And, and to your point, we don't have a choice. She has to carry the baby. She has to birth the baby. Now for yeah. me, I can make the choice to be a present loving father, present loving husband. But to your point, it's a or walk choice. out the door, or walk out the door. <laughs> yeah, no, it's seriously, it's right? I'm like, you know what? I'm good. Right? <laughs> this wasn't it's, what I thought it would be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's not really, it's not really my thing. You know, I'm, I'm, about, I'm, I'm gonna go. Right, mm -hmm. but go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. Off. No, no, that's that's exactly what I that's what I was saying. Kind of um, reflecting off of what you mentioned with the choice and the importance of um, time not making you a man. And we've we've mentioned this before over and over again. There's a lot of young boys and men who are asking for a certain life. They're asking for these blessings in life or these responsibilities. Yeah. Kind of what we we were laughing about before in our pre-interview of you know the, the 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 problems that we pray for the 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 problems of privilege because for men to take on more in life, you have to be able to handle more. That's what I mean by elevate our capacity for life. If we can't manage yeah. the responsibilities we ask for, they slip through our fingers. Then there's overwhelm and um and burnout, and we are not fully equipped to face that a little bit of a tangent, but something tells me you could follow me there. When you mentioned to that exposure therapy and the willingness to encounter fear for a lot yeah. of these adult boys and even young boys growing up, a lot of them never face their trauma. And that's the shadow that we're running from for most of our lives. Yeah. And that fear is almost the string, the puppeteer that's walking us through life without us ever seeing those, those strings. No, I, I, I would agree with that. I think I always often say like the, the most powerful things in your life are the things that impact uh, how you behave and you're not aware of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so to the extent that you have uh, unresolved childhood issues, whatever they may be, that are constantly impacting how you perceive, how you tend to the world, how you interact in the world, and you're not aware of them, you're stuck, right? It's very difficult to get past that. Um, that said, I think that... Um, you, you, you run into, uh, males run into some, some, some very real challenges at a very young age, a relatively young age. And, and part of that is one of the benefits of being a male, being born a male, is you have, you are granted with the capacity to determine what your social value will be. Hmm. One of the downsides of being born a male into most societies is that you have the responsibility of determining <laughs> what your social <laughs> value is, right? And that's, yeah. that's, 
it's one, it's, it's one of the gifts and burns. I always tell my mentees, I'm like, one of the things, and most of them are like, in, I, I usually meet them when they're in their early 20s. And I'm like, you have the capacity, you can build what type of man you want to be. Like, you have that. And what's interesting socially, and this has nothing to do with Ted or me on an individual level, but you have to create value in yourself, which means you need to become competent at something that benefits people other than you. Like that's mm -hmm. what makes you valuable, right? Essentially. I mean, think about it, right? Yeah. Like what, what makes Ted valuable to his community is based on what he's able to contribute to his community as it relates to what his community needs. And the mm -hmm. greater your capacity to, res to positively respond to the needs of your community and your environment, the more valu valuable you are to your community and your environment. Right? Your wife thinks you're valuable if you can contribute these things, whatever those things are, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's competency, whether it's insight, whether it's uh, child care and support, what whatever it is, your capacity to do that, to contribute to your environment, i.e. personal life, friends, family, whatever it may be, and the larger community is heavily predicated on your ability to provide for them things that they need and or find useful. Mm -hmm. You get to decide how competent you are in what in any domain and what domains you want to participate in. You have that capacity. And that's an amazing capacity to have, but it's also a hell of a responsibility to take up. Because if it doesn't work out, right? <laughs> if if Ted at thirty finds himself, and um, if Ted at thirty has not established any sense of personal or social value, Ted has no one to blame other than Ted. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Right, like, you can't. You, you, Social system, yeah. and it's not to say that social systems don't make it difficult, right? Depending on what they are or what your social categories are. I'm not saying there isn't points of resistance. What I'm saying, though, is at the end of the day, you're accountable. Yeah. And that's a difficult, yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a difficult thing for people to come to terms with. And it's a heavy, it's a, it's a hell of a weight to carry. It's a hell of a weight to carry. Right. Yeah. Um, but if you willingly take it up and you willingly pick up that weight and you decide, you know what, I want to be able to do X, Y, and Z and provide this service for my, for my community and, 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 and my, 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 my social environment. And you work on developing and honing the competence in a particular area or a group of areas that you can then contribute to the larger group and community and society. Then, you know, you become more valuable. But the problem is that is you have to, it has to be a willful, you have to willingly do it. You have to be willing to trade innocence for experience. Right? Mm -hmm. You also have to be willing to live an uncomfortable life. Because you can't build character and remain comfortable at the same time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Being so, the sculptor and the marble, you, you, yes. you're going to have to chip away. It's going to hurt. It's <laughs> going to hurt. <laughs> and there's no way around that. Right? Like it's, it's going to hurt. It's going to be uncomfortable. Um, and it should be. It mm. should be. Because you're literally, you're building something from scratch. Now, uh, and you and I talked about this a bit before. Now, ideally, what you have in your environment, um, Anthony Apaya refers to them as, as social scripts. Right? Mm -hmm. What you have in your environment are different ways of being in the world. Right? And this is part of the reason why exposure is so important. Ted doesn't become uh, uh, a news person unless Ted sees right? That as a viable option. Right? Ted is the man he is today in part because of the different types of men he was exposed to growing up. Yeah. 
And he may not have chose any one particular man to model himself after, but what he did do is he pulled from the different scripts of men, the different types of masculinity in his environment. He pulled from those to create a form of masculinity that he felt like he, he could commit himself to. Right? And so he literally mm-hmm. puts himself together. Problem what you run into is when the scripts that you have to pull from, the ways of being uh, masculine or the ways of being a man in your environment when you're pulling from ways of being that are limited or severely impacted by ways of being that do not promote personal evolution or are self-destructive or counterintuitive now you have a problem yeah right yeah when you mentioned the rites of passage um and and the willingness of choice right because yeah honing in on this point of it almost sounds like willingness is that magic sauce yes. where yeah. for, for women, nature built it in, whether they like it or not, the transition's happening for, yeah. for men. But they still have to be men, willing to confront that though. Right. Correct. Because, because I mean, just, just because you can bear a child, just like, just like, just like uh, they used to say back in the day, um, making a kid doesn't make you a father. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's the same thing, right? It's it's just because you can bear a child doesn't make you a woman. Does not. Right? Mm-hmm. And but and so, but what nature does do for females, it confronts them with the need to I take on choice. responsibility. Right? Yeah. So they're immediately confronted by by nature, and there's nothing like that in nature for men. So societies have historically done that. Yeah. So. We're going to, at age 18, we are definitively going to confront you and say, listen to it. At 18, you have to make a decision. Mm-hmm. Are you going to, these are the burdens, these are the responsibilities that are coming to you the moment you turn 18. You have to decide whether or not you're going to take them up. Now, you're going to get them regardless. You're going to get the responsibilities regardless. And if you fail and you continue to fail into your 30s, that's on you. Because you yep. have not willingly confronted these. And the same thing with uh, females. It's like, yes, you can bear children. And and we see it all the time where young girls are confronted by nature with the possibility to have children. And they have children and still don't confront the responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but, but I think what nature does do, it, it initiates that for women in a way that it doesn't for men. But you're right. The secret, the the turning point has to be willing, willingness. Yeah. Has so if, if we find ourselves in an issue where our current societal structure is not providing that catalyst of choice, um, mm-hmm. what could we as fathers, what could any of the young men listening to this who has, haven't hasn't had that rites of passage moment in their lives. I tweeted a while ago and I've asked some friends, like, do you know the moment you became a man? And (laughs) the the answer is almost always no. (laughs) Um, But, but the same question is like, Hey, do you know when you became a woman? And I imagine, um, obviously I can't answer for them, but I would imagine my wife would say something about, yeah, when I got my menstrual cycle or or, or, or something like that, nature dictated that to your point. If iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. But if you're a man and you're alone or listening to this, then who sharpens you? What's going on, guys? Ted Dayton here, host of the Modern Man Podcast, also founder of the Noble Knights Mastermind Group. And I'm just out here encouraging you to find your circle. Maybe you're on a personal growth journey and nobody around you understands the new mentality that you're possessing. That's okay. You can find an online community that will pour into you, will navigate your goals and navigate your obstacles, share their experiences, resources, and more. Join the Noble Knights Mastermind Group and try us out for free to tap into a community of men helping each other scale up and reach their goals. Check out the themodernmanpodcast.com. What could we do for ourselves and for our children, for our families to help uh, initiate that transition for our boys who are coming of age? So I think what's interesting, and I was just talking to a group of students about this earlier today. And I was telling them, I was like, you know, one of the interesting things about human beings is we know more than we understand. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Dude, it, 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 it's, 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 it's almost 
it's, it sounds almost foolish to say, but it's, it's, I think it's a pretty accurate statement. At least I think it is. I, th- I genuinely believe that. And so I think that what you can do as an individual is be honest. Because if you sit, if any, any young man sits on the edge of his bed, wakes up in the morning, puts his feet on the floor and sits there and says, what can I do today? to make my life better. Mm. Honestly, ask that question. I guarantee you, your brain will flood you with about 50 things that you can do in that moment (laughs) to not only improve the quality of your day, but your life and your personal character. It'll flood you with them. But what we typically do is we'll ask that question, how can I make things better? And we get flooded or we get inundated with these things. We're like, yeah, but not that. Like something, give me something else, <laughs> right? You know, like, it might be start working out every day. It's like, oh, well, yeah, that's not really, that's not quite getting it. Nah, I'm, I'm good on that front. Well, give me something else. What else can I do, right? And we whittle all those things down because what it comes down to, it's two things. It's not just what can I do because all of us know what we can do to evolve, all of us. Mm-hmm. We know things that we can do to, to evolve. We know what they are. We can start getting up at the same time every day. It doesn't, and, it, and the thing is, progress isn't the, the progress isn't me moving from point A to point Z in one step. Like that's not progress. Mm-hmm. That's not how progress works, I should say. Progress is A to A1 to A2 to A3. A4. It's incremental by design. So the question, one of the, yes, the, the initial question we can ask ourselves is what can I do to whatever? What can I do to improve the quality of my life? What can I do to be a better husband? What can I do to be a better father? Ask the question. Okay. Then when you're flooded with all of the things that you could be doing, the next question you have to ask yourself is what am I willing to do? <laughs> Willingness. Right. Because it, it's like <laughs> what you need to do is obvious, right? Like it's, it's, it's immediate. That information is immediately available to you the moment you ask the question on mm-hmm. any given topic. The question is, what are you willing to do? And I think this is when ego becomes a problem <laughs> because it's hard for us to be honest with what we're actually willing to do to get better. And sometimes it's simple things. It starts simple. What are you willing to do? My, my wife and I always have this thing in our house. Like the moment you wake up, you make your bed. Like that's what, that's what you do. Yeah. Right. Which sounds like a relatively small thing. And it is, but the fact that you are ordering your life from the moment you wake up, helps to set the structure of the rest of your day. Mm-hmm. And this happens at a psychological level, it happens at an emotional level. Like if you literally wake up in the morning, and if you're not someone who makes your bed, try it. You wake <laughs> up in the morning, you make your bed. It actually sets the tone because what you've done is you've immediately brought order to what is otherwise chaotic, mm-hmm. which is the beginning of your day. Mm-hmm. You set a tone and human beings have a tendency to want to maintain consistency. We like consistency. So if you set that structure in the beginning of your day, which is a relatively simple step, then it helps to, to, to it tends to perpetuate or matriculate throughout the rest of your day. Now, the problem is, is that if I ask myself, honestly, what can I, what can I do? And I get a list of 50 things. And I say, okay, what am I willing to do? And the reality is I'm only willing to make my bed. Like I'm not really, really willing to really put in any work today. Really, only I'm willing to do is make my bed. Our ego says, no, no, it needs to be bigger than that. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start going to the gym four days a week. So, but you haven't developed the will yet. You haven't. And so then you fail at it. Right. And one thing about failure If you try something that is outside of, is too far outside of your capacity, mm-hmm. what you end up doing is hurting yourself. 
I mean, yeah. think about it in terms of lifting weights. Mm -hmm. It's great for if you if you only if you don't lift weight, if you only lift weights that you're capable of, capable of lifting, you won't get stronger. So you have to lift weights that are one step beyond your capacity. Yeah. And then your body will accommodate. You know, again, you'll call for new proteins, you'll bring new muscle fibers into existence, and you'll get gradually stronger, right? Progressive overload is what they typically refer to it as. But if you lift weight that is twice your capacity to lift, you're going to hurt yourself. And so you mm -hmm. end up, if five was your baseline, and you try to lift weight that's at level 10, what's going to end up happening is you'll injure yourself, and your, your baseline is going to fall to a three. Diminishing returns. So now you're worse off than you were in the beginning. And so what tends to happen is, is we're not willing to admit that the most that we're willing to do is make our bed today. We've convinced ourselves that we're willing to go to the gym for the next, for two hours every day for the next four days. Yeah. But we're not really, we're, it's, 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 it's too far beyond us. And so mm -hmm. then we try it and what ends up happening is we typically fail miserably which then discourages our willingness to even try something again the next time. Yeah. And we end up worse off than we were before we tried to commit ourselves. And so it, you have to be, so that's what we can do. You can ask yourself yeah. what needs to be done and then ask yourself, honestly, what are you willing to do? And then whatever that is that you're willing, start there. And it will yeah. build over time by default. It'll build over time as long as you keep working. Yeah, it's inevitable in the process. Uh, I, I say that, you know, the journey is the destination and, and it's a process little by little each, each and every single day. The ego also is, is something I remember researching and studying on procrastination and the fact that we have such high thoughts of ourselves in the future. We're like, oh, tomorrow Ted will go to the gym so I can skip today. Like I have such confidence in my future self that I can procrastinate what I'm supposed to do today because I believe that Ted's not only going to go to the gym tomorrow, he's going to start that business and he's going <laughs> to do all the workouts and everything that he's looking to do. But when tomorrow comes, the present Ted does the same thing. Oh, no, not right now, maybe tomorrow. And then that procrastination uh, becomes a someday, which becomes a no day. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're always um, we're always bargaining with with the future, right? With eternity, so to speak. Right? So it's yeah. like, um, you, we, we make decisions today that impact who we are and who we will be tomorrow. That's, that's what we do. And oftentimes what we do is we sacrifice future self for the comfort of present self. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I want to be comfortable today. So, so what I'll do is the thing that's uncomfortable, I'll put that off until tomorrow. Yeah. Right? And so basically what I'm saying is that future Dante, like, yeah, to hell with him, right? Like he can suffer. I'm not <laughs> suffering today, right? Yeah. He can suffer tomorrow and I'm okay with that, right? Um, but the problem is then you get, what happens is the suffering compounds because I'm not going to get in better shape between now and tomorrow if I don't do anything. I'm actually going to get in worse shape. So mm -hmm. tomorrow I'm going to have more work to do than I would have had if I started today. And if you do that long enough, <laughs> right? You do that long enough. Now you're you're forty pounds overweight. Where now you have to lose forty pounds instead of five. Higher barrier of entry. Yep. You know, and and the the amount of suffering and the amount of work that you have to do just keeps it compounds, mm -hmm. it compounds over time. Which is why you're always kind of playing a game with. In some sense, it's what game theory gets at, right? It's like, what is the what is the optimal trade-off I can make with my future self and my present self? Does that both of us benefit in the ways that we continue to move forward? Mm -hmm. Right. So we can do this long-term. Yeah. Do this yeah. Long -term. But yeah, I mean, it, it is, it is ego. I think part of that is ego for sure. I think part of that is also, uh, we don't know ourselves as well as we think we do. I, I, that I, I tell my, yeah, it, it's, I tell my students all the time. I'm like, it's, I always find it fascinating how we always have solutions to other people's problems and even social problems. Like we, we've got it all figured out, right? Like we can solve the economic crisis. We can solve racism and class. We can, I, I know all the answers to all of that, but yet you don't know yourself well enough to 
ensure that you're going to do tomorrow what you said you were going to do. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, and so, so, so I always, I've always found that, because like you're, I'll put it like this, you are definitively, no one has lied to you more than you. Yeah. Like no one. There's not a person in your life that has lied to you as frequently and as consistently as you've lied to yourself. There's no one in your life who's betrayed you as frequently and as consistently as you betrayed yourself. But the irony is, if someone even started to approach the frequency of betrayal that you embody against yourself, you would have cut them off years ago. Right. Like, I'm not, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't deal with that. He lies too much. Right. He told me he's going to come yeah. by the house. He didn't come by the house today. You know what I mean? Whatever it may not be. Not going to catch me yeah, again. <laughs> yeah. It will catch me again. Like, you know, first time, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. But it's like, but, but, but we don't have that same approach with ourselves. We yeah. genuinely don't. We'll continue to engage in that. And I'll, I'll, I've always found that absolutely fascinating. It's like, you lie to you. You are the you are your you are the worst boss you've ever had and the worst employee you've ever had. <laughs> Hands down. I've noticed too that it almost um and I've identified some very smart people in my life who have that cognitive dissonance where because they're so smart, they've convinced themselves of reality um that perpetuates the problems in which they have. Um and that's from the outside looking in. So I'm most likely doing yeah. the same thing. I know the answer to their problems, but not mine. Um, but yeah. there is that cognitive dissonance that we could see sometimes in people. And I could identify that a lot of it can come down to identity in how they view, picture, and identify themselves. Um, so wanting to respect your time while we're coming up towards the end of the podcast, I want to maybe touch on that in terms of how we lie to ourselves, the identity we've attached to ourselves, how that could perpetuate where we find ourselves and maybe influence the choices we make and where we spend our attention and the willingness we have to take up those responsibilities to help us grow. How does that identity, whether, and, and so, we could be blunt and honest, I could identify in the urban culture, the more of the, the, the patriotic culture. There's so much divisiveness in the world today and everybody's yeah. finding their sex that dictate how they act. So how does that, work against us. So there's a couple of things there. One, the idea that we we tend to think that we know more than we actually know, right? And that was like one of the first things you mentioned. There's a thing, uh, a thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's yeah. absolutely hilarious. It's basically the, the, once people learn a little bit about something, they think they know more than they actually know because they're not actually aware of how ignorant they are. Right? So mm -hmm. they, they become very confident in their, in their dictation. So that happens. Um, but I think also too, to your point about identity, how we self-identify human beings like continuity, we, we have a, a not cause continuity suggests order. And one thing about the humans being in the world is we have a propensity and tendency to create order out of chaos. That's what your brain does. It tries to organize what is other, what it otherwise perceives as chaotic into some type of order. That being said, we tend to to lean towards continuity, and that includes continuity of self. So we have to be consistent, mm -hmm. and that's very, and that tends to conflict with development. Because if I say I am a, if I self identify or define myself as a stand up guy, a person of his word. It becomes that much more difficult for me to acknowledge, even perceive um, the areas in my life where I don't do that because mm -hmm. it conflicts, right? And I, and I don't want the conflict because the conflict creates questions, the questions create chaos, the chaos creates uncertainty. And what I'm looking for is continuity. Does that make sense? And so, yeah. it, it's, 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 it, but it goes back to what we started the conversation with the idea of attention. We, uh, uh, Gandhi has this quote, he was like, um, people seldom find what they're not looking for, mm -hmm. and which is true. And so what we give our attention to in any given, in any given moment, 
whatever we focus our attention on, that is what we tend to see, whether it's there or not, right? <laughs> it doesn't really matter. If, if we believe that it's there, we will find it. We will create it out of the environment that's around us. That's what attention does. But as a consequence, we'll miss everything else that we're not tending to. And this is why it's funny. I was just having this conversation with my research class the other day. I teach grad students, um, and I was talking to them about a hypothesis. I said, I, said the, I said, the beautiful thing about a hypothesis is you're not trying to prove that it's correct. And I was telling them, I was like, this is actually, I, I told them this. I said, you should really consider taking this approach to life, broadly speaking. You don't try to prove a hypothesis correct. You try to prove it wrong. Hmm. And so your hypothesis is, I am a man of good character. That's my hypothesis. And then you spend the rest of your life trying to prove it wrong, which means you're constantly testing it to see if there's a flaw in that. Right. And I never prove it right. What I do is I fail to reject it. <laughs> I fail yeah. to reject it. I, it's like, so today, when I look, when at the end of my day, I look back at my behavior. I look at how I showed up for my kids. I look at how I showed up for my wife and my father and my family and so forth. I look at all of those things. It's like, okay, at any one of those points, did I demonstrate a behavior or a way of being that was inconsistent or that, that did not demonstrate a man of good character? And if I can't find anything, it doesn't mean that I'm a good man. It means I can't yet reject the idea that I'm a good man. But there's there's a possibility it might happen tomorrow. Right? Let me check again so, tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> again tomorrow. And so it, it puts you in a very different framework because what we tend to do is we make a claim, "I'm a good man," and then we spend the rest of our day looking for affirmation of that reality. And because God, of that, <laughs> when we look around the world, all we see are things that tell us what we want to that we've already decided is true. Right? We're not looking for the chinks in the armor, so we don't see them. And when people confront us with them, right, we get defensive. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, and, 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 and you've had, and one, you've been the person who's doing that, and you've also had conversations with someone who's, exactly, like, that's what we do, right? <laughs> you've also had conversations with someone who's doing that. And oftentimes, they even appear to be delusional. It's like, how yeah. do you not see that not showing up for your children <laughs> is 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 the exact that behavior is counter to everything you're saying about yourself as being a person of character. Like, how do you not see that? It's like because they're not looking for it. They're not mm. looking for the flaws, and so we don't see them. And so I think that when you 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 assume the position of um, not that you're right, but always trying to prove your hypothesis wrong. Can I find something in my day that is not consistent with how I have defined myself? And if I, if I genuinely look for it, I'll find it. And then once I find it, I have to be willing to confront it and address it. And then if mm -hmm. I am, that's one less area I have to work on. And then I find the next thing. And so I'm never 100%, I'm never proving at 100% that I am a man of good character. What I'm doing is failing to reject the assumption that I'm a man of good character, but that assumption gets put to the test every day. And the reality is, is that the reality, the truth of that assumption will play itself out in the quality of your life. Mm. Because one thing about life, broadly speaking, is it doesn't lie to you. Immediate feedback. Well, not always immediate, immediate but... You'll get feedback. You can't, you can't cheat it. You can't cheat life. You can't. It's 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 it's, it's gonna it's gonna always be brutally honest with you. But the question is, it goes back to that willingness. I'm going to be honest with you, Ted. The question is, are you willing to listen? Yeah. And if your life does not look the way that you want it to look, it's because you have not become the man that you want to be, or that you think you are. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, don't, I don't care how bad your social system is. I don't care how bad your relationship is, right? If, you're, if, if, you're, if, you, if your life does not look the way that you want it to look, it's because you haven't done what it takes to address it. It's that simple. Man, 
That's mic drop right there. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's it's a difficult. I think it's a difficult thing for us to kind of come to terms. Like, I have a friend of mine. He and I were talking one day. And he was having some problems in his marriage, and, and he was like, you know, um, I'm having conflicts with my wife, this, that, and the other. And I was like, okay. And he kept talking about like things that they needed to work on. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, if you want to improve the quality of your marriage, you can you can comprehensively improve every aspect of your marriage without ever talking to her. Because if you improve, right, mm-hmm. your condition changes. It's just that's how it works, right? Yeah. If Ted, if the if Ted's character changes, how Ted experiences his condition changes. Period. And even though your environment might still be equally as toxic, equally as oppressive, its impact on you will not be the same because you're not the same person. Mm. Does Just that make sense for life? Yeah. Yeah, that's, I say increase your capacity for life because yeah. things are going to so happen. The weight, <laughs> the, the weight didn't get, 225 didn't get less. It's still 225, right? What happened was I increased my, my bench. I increased my capacity to lift it. That's what happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I, before my max was 205, I experienced 225 as absolutely crushing. But as I developed me, and develop my capacity from progressive overload, from constantly identifying areas where I can improve and working on that areas. When I got to the point where I could lift 225 as my max. And so 225, the condition of 225 has not changed. It's exactly the same way it was six months ago. But mm-hmm. what has changed is my capacity to bear the weight of 225. And so now I look at 225 and what I see is an ally, something I can use to get to 250. Whereas before, I just saw it as a crushing adversary. Does that make sense? And so, 100%. But that's based on the willingness. The willingness to confront um, fears, anxieties, doubts, uncertainties, our flaws, more specifically. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the things about ourselves that we try to avoid. Yeah. It's all rooted in willingness. It's all of it's rooted in willingness. Yeah. And that's how you go from the dog being out the door five minutes to ten minutes to being in the room to your pet and the dog to you buy now, one. Now you got four <laughs> living in your house, right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm I got Bruno in the other room. I'm about to go <laughs> throw the ball with him afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> it's, to, to your point, it's all it's all rooted in willingness. But I think to your uh, your other point about um, one of the things that we don't do well, we're not currently doing well, is we don't present models to young men today on how to actually do that. We haven't done a very good job. We we have, we have deteriorated as a society in our efforts to do that. Um, Yeah. This is cross culturally within the West, right? It's, it's, it's it's more pronounced within the African American community um, because that's how problems matriculate, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, Yeah. it, It is an issue. It's a very real issue. And so what we typically have now is we have a bunch of boys who want certain outcomes, but don't realize that you have what is required to get there. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's at the end of the day, it's not about the outcome. That's, that's not, the willingness is not about the outcome. The willingness is about the process. And yeah. the process builds the character that makes the outcome possible. That's how it works. Yeah. Kind of saying, hey, man, like I can't, I'm, I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm just telling you it's going to be worth it. Now let's get it. Yeah, that, that's really yeah. it. That's really it. And, 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 and the thing is, if it were easy, um, then it wouldn't have any value. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because um, it, 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 to get what you want, you have to be willing You have to be willing to sacrifice. And essentially what you're typically sacrificing is who you currently are for who you desire to be. Yeah. That's the greatest sacrifice. And it's taking human beings. It's it's taking human beings a long time to realize that, right? Like we've tried sacrificing all kinds of things, virgins, pigs, (laughs) ducks, you know what I mean? Like lambs. How can I get the outcome that I want? And 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 this is what what that fast about like religious texts is that you know you can, you can see the evolution of our understanding of sacrifice. And one as it comes to terms with at the end of the day is no no no, the greatest sacrifice that Ted has to offer 
is Ted's life. Yeah. <laughs> That's the sacrifice. <laughs> it's like sac Ted sacrifices his life today in order to be resurrected tomorrow as a better version of Ted. That's the mm. sacrifice. So Man. you have to be willing to let to who you currently are die so that who you desire to be can be born. That's the sacrifice. And that man is fighting to come out, man. Fighting Always. to come out. Because I mean, who wants to go? Like no one, you know. He's gonna. He's going to fight. Who you currently are is going to fight for his life, and he should. He mm -hmm. should fight for his life, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. how he got here, right? That's how he yeah. got here. He say, like, "Okay, I, I respect you. I appreciate you. I thank you for bringing me this far, but you're not. You don't have the capacity to go where I'm going. And think about it like this." If you were in a relationship with someone and you recognize that that person didn't have the capacity, they were great for you when you were 16. They don't have the yeah. capacity to go where you're going when you're 35. You let them go. Loving. Right? <laughs> yeah. I love you. You know, I have some boys I grew up with. I'm like, listen, where I'm going, y'all can't go. You know, I may come back and visit you every now and then, but you can't go where I'm going. So I'm going to have to let you go. And we're, we're more comfortable doing that with other people than we are other versions of ourselves. <laughs> yep. yep. Right? And that's why I said, if, if you had someone in your life who lied to you, betrayed you, backstabbed you, and let you down as often as you've done it to yourself, you would have left them years ago in order to, to, to have a better life. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> the lie so like, that your current self is telling you is that the grass is greener here, not over there. And that's what keeps you stuck where you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You, you say, like, nah, we good. We're good. We're good. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. We don't need yeah. that. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to work to have what you want. You don't need to sacrifice me to get what you want. It's like, it, but, but I do because the man I'm trying to be is not consistent with the man who I currently am. They're not mm. consistent in it. They're not, they're not compatible in every way. If they were 100% compatible, I would already be that man. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's like, Dante. So, yeah. we, we can go, we can go on and on. Man. Need to be better. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it is. Like, so, <laughs> yeah. I, I'll say this. I think there are men listening or watching on YouTube right now who feel that gap in their lives of who they want to yeah. be and who they are. And that the gap, that void, it, it could be yeah. deep, man. It could be bottomless. Um, yes. But that feeling is is the desire for your your evolved self to come out, and the fighting of your current self. And that's yeah. that's the struggle that's, so many of us find ourselves in. Well, that's the discontent, right? Yeah. You, you, you discomfort. Um, P.D. Uspinski uh, talks about this idea of discomfort. Like you, it's the discomfort that actually causes you to move. Mm -hmm. That's why I said yep. before you can't be you can't be a man of character and also be comfortable at the same time, right? Because it's the discomfort. There's something about my current state, my current environment that I am uncomfortable with. And so I need to do something, right, to remedy <laughs> this internal conflict that I'm experiencing, this discomfort that I'm experiencing. Yeah. And so, okay, well, what can I do? And then you say, okay, now these are the things I can do. What am I willing to do? And then you start there. Whatever, however simple or small that thing is. Like, so I, 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 there was periods of time, large periods of time in my life where I would get up at like four o'clock in the morning. I would exercise. I would read. I would do all these things, right? And I would always tell my wife, like, you know, whenever I start that process, it's the first thing I do. I don't get up and do all of that in the same morning, the first time. Like, I, I literally don't. I'm like, okay, yep. my goal right now is just to wake up, to wake my ass up at 4.15. Like, that's my goal, just to wake up. And I'll wake up, and I'll sit there in the bed, and I'll be like, damn, all right, well done, brother. And I go right back to sleep, right? You did. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I mean, look, one step. Right. And I may yep. do that for the first four or five days. And then next I'm like, okay, now that I've got that under control. Okay. Um, now let me get up out of the bed. And so I'll wake up at 4.15 and now I get up. I'm still not exercising. I'm not reading a book. 
I'm not stretching. I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. I'm just one step, one step. And when all of a sudden I look up a month later, I have gradually taken up all of those things. And then I walk and I'm sitting around. My life starts to get better. I'm healthier. I'm looking healthier. I'm talking to Ted. And Ted's like, man, what are you doing? You know, you look great. Well, I get up at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I get up at four o'clock in the morning. I stretch. I meditate. I pray. I get on a bike. I ride for 30 minutes. And then I take a shower, get dressed, and get back to his work. Take the and picture of a dope, dope fit and then share it on IG. Yeah, take a picture. <laughs> and then like, I see you. You're doing all, you do all of this in the morning. I'm like, yeah. Right. But Ted doesn't realize I didn't just start doing that. Yeah. yeah I had yeah. to build my capacity by, te- by literally going, okay, what can I do? I can do all of these things. Now, what am I willing to do? Well, right now, I'm just willing to get up. That's all I'm willing to do. Right. Yeah. And then you build on that over time. And this is the funny thing about success. Success compounds success. Like even statistically, it naturally compounds success. So the as you successfully accomplish a task, it increases the likelihood of you being successful in the next task you build on top of that. And that literally compounds over time. Yeah. Yeah, man. Dante, I want to make sure um, our our audience and, and our watchers can connect with you and follow more of your amazing stuff, brother, because I, I know we've just scratched the surface of, of your expertise. And, and going from this topic, I would, on the show, want to invite you back yeah. on to do another one um, and, man, and go even deeper, I, man. I told you, but we, you and I talked when we first met, like, I'm always up for a good conversation. <laughs> just a bit <laughs> Uh, I, I enjoy sitting down talking to people as much as, as anyone does. So I, I, I'd be happy to come back anytime you want me around, whatever it may be, whatever I can contribute, man. I'm, I, I'm 100% there for sure. Yeah, for I sure. appreciate that, man. How can um, yeah. some of our listeners and viewers connect with you, follow you? Uh, what links or socials uh, can you advert them to, to 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 follow you, brother? Yeah, I probably need to do better about that. As it relates to social media. <laughs> Really, the only thing I have at this point is I have an Instagram page that is um, at um, it's a underscore Southern man. Um, that's about really the only social media that I have. Yeah. And really, the only thing I do there is I just I started I started the Instagram page to promote more positive images of black people. So I literally and all I really do, I take a photo of um, myself before work, what I'm wearing to work. Because I do believe there's a relationship between um, aesthetics, embodiment, movement, and how you are identifying and identifying yourself in the world. And so then yeah. I post that on there. And then usually in the caption, there is um, there's a series of statements. Usually there's always a thought of the day, which is something that I may have been wrestling with relates, uh, as it relates to how to continue to develop and evolve as a person. And that's usually kind of the, the meat of the, the primary focus of the, the post. Um, yeah. Other than that, man, I really... You could shoot me an email, I suppose, at uh, Dante dot Bryant. Yeah, Dante dot Bryant at UNCC dot edu. Mm-hmm. I'm always happy to, to email back and forth or send whatever resources or information people are looking for if I'm if I have access to them to send them in the yeah. right direction. So. Yeah. I love it, man. I'll be sure to have those links in the show notes below so folks can just open that up, uh, open the description on YouTube and, and jump right in. Um, last, yeah. last question, um, and it, it's a deep one, but something tells me you, you won't have a problem going there. What's something that you've seen or something that's happened to you that shapes the way you view the world as a man? Honestly, watching other men navigate it, other men who I would consider to be better than myself, mm-hmm. um, particularly the men I watched growing up, my father, my grandfather, the men in my the men in our community, and, and how the I think not just how they moved in the world, but how they carried themselves in the world, and I mean yeah. that from everywhere from how they dressed to how they spoke to people, how they treated people, and having a sense of dignity and pride in all of that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think those are the things that are have had the greatest impact on how I choose to show up in the world. Love it, man. I love it. Thank you so much for being on. We have assistant professor in the School of Social Work and College of Health and Human Services and affiliated faculty member in the Department of Africana Studies at UNC 
Charlotte, Dr. Dante Bryant. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, brother. I know our audience definitely was enriched by your insights and your conversation so much. So I'm going to recap some of the 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 gems you left along the way because I know a lot of people are driving, they're they're working out. I know we had a lot of workout references, um, so they're not able to take notes. Don't worry, guys. I did it for you. And what is the only true human commodity? We started with that, right? And it was the attention. And we discussed how that attention is pivotal in the journey for the male becoming a boy, the boy becoming a man, which is a choice that is enhanced with the willingness. Cultures, historically, having a rites of passage. Mother Nature providing that for women, not so much for men. So our, our current societal structure does not have that implemented. So what does it look like for us as men to step into that transition into manhood? Well, first, it's the willingness. Second, it's the choice, uh, a, a choice that we are willing to take on the responsibilities and the challenges, slowly increasing our capacity and slowly increasing what we are handling, being accountable, being honest with ourselves, leaning into social scripts, ways of being in the world, and identifying what those social scripts are, and also asking those questions and being honest and establishing that hypothesis because we lie to ourselves more than anybody else. And instead of proving the hypothesis right, we should focus every single day on proving that hypothesis wrong. Look for the flaws. And if you can't find any today, let's check again tomorrow. And if you want to improve, lean into a community, lean into men that'll keep you accountable, lean into a brotherhood, other examples, reach out to Dante, reach out to myself, hop into the Noble Knights to catch a community of men who are elevating their capacity for life so they can connect with other men in pursuit of their potential to contribute positively, wholeheartedly and selflessly to their communities, families, and those that love them. So guys, thank you for being part of the journey. Dante, thank you for being on the show and thank you for making it to the end, guys. As we always say, Everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the rain. But you can't get the pleasure without first the pain. Let's grow.